Hello everyone and welcome to day 40 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, so today we have the, uh, the promised uh, stream on uh, how to program assembly language, you know, for our usual audience, which, uh, which consists mostly of C programmers. And so I've been um, kind of thinking about this for, for the last week about uh, how to present this. Um, it, I didn't get quite as much preparation as I wanted because I've kind of been thinking, my brain has been 99% full of the fourth stuff we've been working on uh, on, uh, on the streams and that I've still been thinking on, uh, thinking about off stream. Um, but I, uh, I, I didn't want to delay it any further. And so without further ado, uh, I want to, uh, to do that today. Um, and hopefully once I do the, uh, an article covering some of the same content, it will be a little more structured and, um, and uh, you know, kind of, reviewed I guess by uh, by other people but uh, but for now this is sort of my I guess my first live draft of, of uh, what I think is a reasonable approach to writing assembly language by hand um, and so before we jump into that I just want to set expectations um, the, uh, the the major disclaimer is um, the approach I'm going to show for writing assembly language by hand is uh, is quite different from you know what I learned um, when when I learned assembly language in in the 90s from uh, writers like Michael Abrash, who was sort of a, a big figure in in the PC community and teaching people how to write high performance assembly code. And uh, I want to say something about that because most people uh, who write assembly code nowadays s s still have that mindset, which is the correct mindset, um, if you're ever writing assembly code by hand, usually it's because the compiler let you down in some way, uh, and so you don't do it for fun, uh, right? You don't do it for fun, you do it because you want to beat the compiler typically. Uh, or maybe you're a low-level programmer who has to do, you know, you're writing firmware or something where maybe you, you don't have uh, enough of a machine uh, sort of brought up to the point where you can g execute general purpose code or, uh, or something like that. Um, or you need very specific machine specific instructions but but aside from that the main reason that say application level programmers or even system level programmers write assembly is if they want to beat the compiler at its own game um, what we'll be doing today is explicitly not about beating the compiler uh, in fact uh, the approach I'll be advocating is almost surely to lose to a really good optimizing compiler because um, although I mean that's only true if you stop uh, if you follow what I'm going to explain mechanically, um, what, I'll, what I'll be explaining is actually how a lot of uh, sort of optimization-oriented programmers start, like a first draft of assembly code um, before uh, optimizing it by hand further. But I'm not going to focus on the optimization part. I'm going to focus on the translation part. So my goal is basically to show you, if you're a C programmer, how to, uh, in, a, in a fairly mechanical fashion that doesn't require a lot of, of, of intuition or, uh, or cleverness, how to translate a C program to assembly language um, you know, by hand without compiler assistance or some other tool assistance. Well, I guess except for an assembler. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's really the major disclaimer is to, is to say that it, it's it's not going to focus on um, on why you would want to write assembly in the first place. I mean, for us, it's partly because we're bootstrapping and so we don't have a compiler yet, and also because I want to show people how to do it. Um, but you know, most people wouldn't write assembly for no good reason, and, um, um, and and it's certainly true that if you're writing assembly, say if you're on PC or something like that. Uh, writing x86 assembly, there better be a good reason, and pro usually it's for performance or something like that, or you're doing very low-level stuff, um, where a compiler, you're trying to beat the compiler, or you, or you can't use a compiler. So uh, that's not really what we'll be focusing on. Um, and, and, the, and the second reason I think the approach I'll be taking is the right one for us, is that once we write um, the code generating backend for our ION compiler to target RISC-V, um, it's essentially going to be a, an implementation of these same ideas I'm going to present because a compiler has to know how to translate different kinds of high-level constructs in, you know, in ION, which is a C-like language, into machine code. And uh, it needs a mechanical process to do so. Uh, and our compiler initially is not going to be anywhere near a modern optimizer compiler in terms of code quality, uh, like the quality of the generated code. 
Uh, and so a second goal, or I guess a side effect of, of the approach I hope to be, uh, to be showing you is that it will kind of be a soft intro to how you might write a compiler, um, the, you know, a compiler uh, backend that generates assembly code or machine code in a straightforward way, in other words, without fancy optimizations. Um, so that's the major disclaimer and kind of explanation of why I'm taking that approach. Uh, the intended audience is pretty much the usual Bitwise audience, so it's people who are fluent in C, have uh, you know a machine level understanding, but maybe aren't used to to writing assembly code at all. Um, and yeah, like I said, goals is to show you how to, um, to translate high level um, C like code into kind of explicit assembly code, um, but it's not to show you how to you know beat the compiler um, at its own game. Um, the approach I'll be taking is to um, basically to exploit the fact that C uh, that C is a pretty low-level language. I mean, there's there are certain things that the standard doesn't guarantee, uh, which we will maybe be exploiting. Uh, like we'll, we'll we'll kind of be a, uh, using a version of C that uh, might not quite be compatible with the standard, but is sort of morally um, C-like and uh, is, is how is, is in any case valid in the real world in most cases, and so the approach we'll be taking is uh, to take a C program and gradually transform it um, to something more explicit until the gap between the C code we end up with and the target language of the machine we're targeting um, is small enough that uh, we can we can make a kind of one-to-one -one translation between the C code and the assembly code, and the advantage of that is that um, as we're gradually transforming our program, um, we will, um, at every stage, we will have a C program, so we can use our intuition as C programmers to validate that it's doing the right thing. And in most cases, unless we're using kind of pseudocode for some things, maybe, uh, we'll actually also be able to execute it as a C program and have the compiler uh, process it as usual. Um, and so uh, the approach I'll be taking is basically taking sort of an example-driven approach and showing how different language constructs translate. Um, and I might just pull random examples from our existing code base uh, and, and show how they um, and show how they they go over. So um, with, with no further ado, let's let's get into it. Um, all right, where to start? Um, there's um, so uh, goal translate from from C to assembly. Um, now, throughout, uh, since we're focusing on RISC-V uh, in Bitwise right now, I'll be using uh, RISC-V assembly uh, as the target language. Um, depending on the target language and you know what, what instructions are available and whatnot, uh, some things will require more or less translation. And so, for example, uh, this is something we'll get into in a sec, but um, you know, most modern instruction sets uh, don't have subword arithmetic operations. Like, um, you know, if, if in our case, we, we can only do 32-bit operations. Uh, and so if we want to support, um, you know, doing byte-wise or uh, half-word-wise arithmetic, we have to synthesize it out of word, word-wise arithmetic operators. Um, Whereas, you know, if you look at something like x86, it can do 8-bit adds uh, and 16-bit adds, uh, and it has registers that can be, you know, like, partly because of its legacy in, in, in much older computers, um, you know, uh, EAX, which is a 32-bit register, can be subdivided into AX, its lower 16-bit part, which in turn can be subdivided into AL and AH. And if you want, you can do 8-bit and 16-bit operations using those sorts of legacy operations, but in RISC-V and most sort of newer instruction sets, um, you don't have that option if you want to um, to synthesize, uh, if you want to do you know, 8-bit math or 16-bit math, you have to somehow m make it work uh, using these built-in, say, 32-bit operators. Um, so that, that kind of thing will differ between instruction sets. And another example is um, RISC-V is a compare and branch uh, language in, in the sense that, um, just to remind you, um, the way you do conditional branches is uh, it does a comparison um, like testing whether two registers are equal or whether one register is less than the other register interpreted either as signed or unsigned and then conditionally branches to a certain target based on that. 
Um, so that's one style of sort of branch instruction design, uh, a more conventional design, uh, which uh, used to be universal and, and even in some risks is used, um, many risks actually, is uh, to have uh, implicit status flags where the comparison and the conditional branch are two separate instructions. So for example, in x86, um, if you do something like this, um, uh, this is a comparison operation. This basically does a comparison that sets certain internal uh, st flag bits depending on the outcome of this comparison. And then separately, you you know, you would do a jump based on the outcome uh, of that comparison, which is really doing a branch based on the values of those internal status bits. So for example, uh, you might do uh, you might do something like jump EQ, uh, which is really jump zero, uh, jump if zero, because uh, internally comp is really a subtraction that doesn't store its result uh, anywhere, but but does set the status bits as if it were a subtraction. Uh, and so this is, you know, kind of a more conventional style of, of compare and branch where you have two separate instructions. Uh, Risk five has this fused compare and branch. And if you want to target these instructions, again, there's going to be some differences in the lower level details of how you structure your, uh, your code. And that's true whether you're uh, a human assembly language programmer or a compiler that generates code for those architectures. So those sorts of details are going to, to differ, but uh, the majority of things are going to be the same, basically. Um, so anyway, that's the high level goal. And um, um, uh, let's see here. Idea, gradually lower C towards target language. So that's the idea, is that um, we're going to gradually lower. So the word lower means to, uh, it's kind of a compiler term. Lower means to, to take a language um, that uses a lot of high-level features, maybe. So for example, in C, high-level features might include stuff like, um, I don't know, I mean, even pointer arithmetic in some sense is higher level, right? Because pointer arithmetic is uh, is not just addition or subtraction of values. There's some implicit size of the underlying type that's being taken into consideration. Uh, so like, you know, pointer arithmetic expressions, right? That's a high level feature that doesn't exist in assembly language. Um, things like uh, register allocation uh, functions, right? Functions don't really exist in assembly language. Some older assembly languages have more explicit support for um, for calls and returns. But for example, RISC-V uh, doesn't. There's a convention for how to synthesize calls and returns. Um, but you know, you just, you're just you really just given some basic building blocks and it's your job to build, build those facilities yourself. Um, but in any case, so there's a bunch of these higher level features. And um, one of the things we'll do uh, in our process of translating C to assembly language is to gradually remove dependency on those higher level features. So for example, um, just to give some examples, uh, I'll go over it more systematically, but I'd want to give some examples of what I mean by lowering. Um, suppose I have a, um, um, suppose I have a, um, um, what's an example? Suppose I have a, an int pointer, um, and so it has some value. And um, and I want to, you know, and you, and you have, uh, you know, and, and there's also uh, there's also some number, and you want to do this kind of point arithmetic. Um, when we're doing the the, the plus n, um, the important thing to note is that yeah, it's an it's a, it's an addition numerically, but you have to take into account the size of int. So if you want to think of um, of int as a, uh, you know, as a numerical value, it would be, I mean, and I'll do the casts uh, just to be explicit, but this is actually a case where the C code ends up more verbose than the assembly code. Um, but uh, let's see here. You, uh, you, you first, I mean, again, this is pretty verbose in C, but you convert P to, to a numerical value um, and then you add n, and um, because it's point arithmetic, you have to do something like this. Um, you have to multiply n, uh, the increment, by the size of the base type, which is n. So that's an example of lowering. 
Um, and at this point, uh, we now have um, yeah, let's do it like that. Um, we now have a, uh, we've now removed, we're not doing pointer arithmetic anymore. We're just doing some casts, which are just mostly just to be consistent with C, uh, but we're just really doing some, some multiplies. Here we're multiplying by a constant, which is usually four, right? Uh, and then we're, uh, we're multiplying four by, you know, if P, if P and N are in registers at this point, you multiply one register by four, and then you add that to P. Um, and so, um, if you imagine, uh, again, so to sort of show the process, there's actually two steps because we still have compound expressions here. Uh, so we have one expression, which is the multiplication nested within another expression, which is the addition. And so if you wanted to, uh, to, to take a further step, you would um, maybe do something like this. Uh, well, let's just be explicit about this so we don't have to worry about weird uh, sign stuff. Um, you might do something like this, introduce a new temporary um, for that sub-expression. And, um, and then uh, add that here. So here we did uh, two transformations. Um, And uh, th that's a very simple example of lowering. And um, we may, as we go proceed, I may get more sloppy about some of these casts in the cases where, uh, well, I, no, I shouldn't be. L let, me, let me try to be uh, explicit about these casts as much as possible uh, so, so we don't get confused. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an example of lowering, is taking a quote unquote higher level feature and uh, gradually removing use of it until we have something uh, which is straightforward. Um, uh, and then, you know, direct translation to assembly. Um, you would uh, do something like, um, well, d depending on, th there's a question of, of how explicit you want to be, um, but um, but, but let's just be very, uh, ain't all about it. Just to show you what I mean here. But we, we will, for a lot of these things, we will skip some of the steps when they're obvious. Um, but, but for this example, let's just be painfully uh, explicit. So once we're at this point, we basically have something that directly corresponds to assembly code. Um, so, um, So we assume that P and N are currently in registers, um, and at this point we are going to um, we're going to do a, a, a left shift. Um, and I'm going to put this in comments, which I, I, if you remember when we did this case from the fourth assembly the other day, I kind of did the same thing. I'm going to try doing that once we, at least in the beginning when we do our um, our translation. I'm going to try keeping these uh, comments that correspond to the original C code, so you can kind of see the one-to-one -one correspondences. So this is a, um, a, a a logical left shift, and so the target register is T1, which is just a temporary, um, and uh, and this is going to be an immediate uh, because we're shifting by two, which is a constant, and uh, so we're going to shift by uh, by that, uh, and then for P, uh, you know, we want to reassign P. And so at this point, we just have a two operand, um, a two operand uh, instruction. And uh, keep in mind that uh, even though RISC V is a three operand uh, instruction set, we, in our assembler, uh, we have this shorthand for two operand instructions where if you only have two operands, uh, RS1, which is the first source operand, is implicitly the same as the destination register. So uh, I'll be using that because so much, uh, so, so many cases are, uh, are two operands and, and they're more concise and 
correspond more closely to the C code because this is kind of like this, right? Um, so anyway, so so that's the basic idea. Uh, and again, this is this has more kind of explicit intermediate steps, and we'll probably be using. Um, but it, in theory, you can do everything like in this style, uh, very explicitly, removing uh, dependencies on features uh, until we're really at the point where everything is, uh, you know, obviously equivalent to some assembly code. Um, and of course, I mean, some of these things could have been done differently. This is maybe where this would be an optimization. If you, if you, you can think of this as being an optimization. You could have implemented this as an actual multiplication by four, um, but actually we don't even, our current instructions, it doesn't even support um, <laughs> multiplication instructions, although that's easy to add. Um, one, one case where you do uh, want to not be too stupid is, uh, you know, when you're doing this kind of address math, using shifts for the common uh, for the common operand sizes is, it, it almost doesn't qualify as an optimization. That's just like hygiene. Like just, you should just do that as a matter of course. Uh, when I say we won't do optimizations, I mean fancier stuff, uh, but we will try not to be stupid at least, which is a, a good first step um, in writing good, uh, you know, fast code. But anyway, so that's an example of, uh, of how this process proceeds. Um, All right, um, so that's the approach. Um, just bring up. All right, um, so uh, I, be, be, before we dive in more systematically, let's try to make a list of features in C that are in some sense higher level than what's directly available in assembly language, because then that provides sort of a, a, a you know a to do list of things we have to um, of, of things we have to cover in order to be able to translate C code to assembly code. Uh, features in C not available in assembly. I mean, and, and this is uh, sort of in scare quotes because you know uh, some some assembly languages may uh, that may not be available in assembly. In an assembly language, um, you know, and the caveat is also even if a machine language doesn't have a feature, it's quite common for assembly languages to offer pseudo instructions or other helper features that bridge the gap, and so uh, keep that in mind. Um, but um, let's go, uh, let's go over it. Um, um, Non-word size data types. Um, subword integers um, Um, structs, compound data types, um, so let's, let, let's not belabor the whole thing about pointers not technically being the same as a number when you're talking about their arithmetic. Uh, I don't know what the right notation here is. Maybe I'll do it like that. Um,
um, nested expressions. variables, uh, functions, um, structured, control flow, um, let's see here, let's not be too explicit in this initial list. Um, Nested sub expression, short circuiting, I mean this is kind of related to nested expressions but um, let's just treat this separately because this one is uh, kind of noteworthy. Um, let's see here, what else am I missing? I'm, so this is definitely one point of arithmetic, yep. Nested expressions. Um, that's a big one. That's really one of the defining things in some sense about assembly language is that everything, you know, if you think of it as in C terms, it's like everything is a statement, uh, a simple a simple statement where maybe there is one sub one sub expression, right? Like if you're doing an addition, it's like assigning the result of a simple addition of two variables to another variable. Um, so kind of nested uh, or compound expressions is, is one of the big things, um, in my opinion, that a higher level language brings to bear. And one reason is that you don't have to um, explicitly assign temporary variables. So the data flow is, very, is, is implicit from sub-expressions to super-expressions. Whereas once you break everything down into these sort of bits, bit, uh, bitsy assembly style statements, then you have to trace how the data flows by looking at what variables are uh, read from and written to, which um, is uh, is not a major burden, but compared to you know <laughs> the difficulty of programming at large, but it just adds unnecessary verbosity and also unnecessary obfuscation, even though it's very explicit. So it's a good example of something that is in some sense more explicit. Uh, in assembly language, but um, more uh, harder to see what's actually going on um, because you have to reconstitute the data flow by by tracing everything through uh, the operations. So uh, nested compound expressions, variables, um, local and global variables, those are actually separate uh, to a large extent. Um, um, Functions for sure, structured control flow, uh, you know things like go to or uh, are very much you know that's kind of an assembly style feature. So go to is not really um, is not something you have to work hard at uh, lowering to assembly language, but things like if and while and uh, and whatnot, uh, those sorts of things do require some translation. Uh, short circuiting expressions with implicit control flow. You know what? Let me just bring up our AST file for ion because it probably, if I look at like the expression kinds, um, uh, maybe I will, um, uh, maybe uh, some things will will, will jump out. Uh, let me just also say like missing operations, um, which is pretty common. This is not a big one, but um, you know, it's pretty common that some instruction sets, like especially RISCs, may not offer uh, a direct equivalent of something that might be available on an older Cisco-like architecture. So, for example, uh, if you want to do uh, sign extension or zero extension, say, so you you have a um, you want to take the lower eight bits in a register and you want to uh, fill in the upper, say, 24 bits as either all ones or all zeros, depending on the eighth bit, which is the sign bit, if you interpret that as a signed 8-bit quantity. Um, x86 and a bunch of older architectures have, like, you know, they have, like, move move CX and move SX for doing uh, sign extended and, and zero extended register-to-register uh, uh, -register moves. But on something like RISC-V and MIPS, um, those sort of things are not directly available, and so you have to sort of synthesize them. And uh, those are not too difficult um, to do, but you kind of need to build up a dictionary. You need to build up like a list of things 
uh, for any given target architecture, you need to l build up like a playbook of uh, of how to synthesize a missing operation. Um, so, so there's usually a whole bunch of those, but those are kind of leaf level uh, concerns and not too difficult. But uh, but those are definitely something you need to to think about. Um, so let's see if there's something else I'm missing here. Local and global variables. Um, Structure control flow. I mean, this is maybe enough to get started. Uh, actually, let me just quickly glance on this again. Um, conversions. Yeah, so casts. Casts are a little bit weird from an assembly language perspective because they can be quite different. They can either be completely trivial, like literally don't do anything at the assembly level. Uh, sometimes they do, you know, sometimes they do sign extension or zero extension. Sometimes they involve an actual a real heavy duty operation, like if you're converting from ints to floats or vice versa, that's, uh, you know, uh, there's always, I think always a built-in operation for that if, if your uh, instruction set has float operations. But, you know, some things are kind of invisible, some things are simple and others are, I mean, they may be a single instruction, but they involve substantial work. Call and index, um, I guess, yeah, pointer arithmetic uh, arrays. Um, let's put that under, um, under pointer arithmetic because C, C treats them so similarly and uh, that's basically, you know, even if your language doesn't, um, like Pascal, for example, doesn't have pointer arithmetic, uh, just has normal arrays, even if you're doing array indexing, um, you would basically do it more or less the same way you would do pointer arithmetic anyway. So, um, but, but maybe let's let's put this up here. Um, let's see here, fields, compound initializers. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe do that. Ternary, I mean, that's kind of just control flow and expression context. Um, yeah, okay, that looks reasonable. Let me just quickly look at our statements. Um, um, Maybe we won't cover switch today. That's kind of a low level. You can synthesize switch out of if else if, uh, or you can use jump tables. Um, but um, maybe that's, let's see if we can get to that today. Let me just see what else is here. Okay, I think that looks good. That's probably a good list to start with in terms of what we want to figure out how to translate. All right. Um, Yeah, so someone so someone was adding a, a list of more missing operations, um, and you're right. Like, um, I mean, what's an example? Um, you know, there's stuff like this. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to make a list here. I'll cover those when we get to it. But yeah, um, and then, so, so someone was mentioning, you know, like, uh, for example, there is only a branch if less than, uh, there, there is only a branch if less than. So basically, I think it goes like this. There is branch then less than and branch if greater than or equal. But there is no branch greater than because if you do uh, do this, uh, sorry, if you want to do this, it's the um, it's the equivalent to just doing less than or reversing the operands. Uh, and so that's an example of a missing operation, although a particularly trivial case. Um, the, the one thing to say about this is this is an example of something that usually the assembler will do for you. Like it usually has pseudo instructions for that stuff. So um, if, I mean, yeah, if, if you're writing a compiler that directly targets machine language, then you would have to worry about it. Um, but if you're using an assembler, often it will have pseudo instructions for the most obvious kinds of things. But uh, usually only the simple ones. Like for example, um, just just as a preview, if you want to do um, if you want to do sign extension of an eight bit um, of an eight bit value, you do what is it? Shift uh, shift left logical um, by twenty four, uh, and then shift right arithmetically by twenty four. Um, and you know it would if it was zero extension it would be a, it would be a, a logical right shift. So this is an example of of how to synthesize uh, sign extension and zero extension uh, as a register to register op out of um, 
uh, shifts and either using arithmetic or logical right shifts, um, depending on whether you're doing sine or zero extension. Um, that's something that most assemblers wouldn't offer pseudo instructions for, although you could. Uh, typically, pseudo instructions for the most common cases are, you know, for the really trivial things that are one to one, like one instruction translate to another instruction of the of roughly the same kind. Um, but anyway, yeah, we can maybe cover these later when we run into specific cases. But yeah, it's pretty common for any given architecture to have a bunch of of, of cases like this you have to uh, to figure out. All right. Um, so. Uh, where to uh where to start maybe i'll permute this list a little bit so that we can cover them in an order that makes more sense like for example i want to talk something about uh, variables because we'll be you know we'll be referencing variables all the time and it, uh one all right Does this look like a good list? Okay, let's just uh, let's let, let's get started here. Um, let's get started here. Um, local and global variables. So um, this is where already um, I'm going to be a little bit. I'll return to this later. Um, but my initial assumption, my initial assumption. Initial assumption, all local variables fit in registers. Um, and the reason I'm going to assume that is that it means that when we're doing this stuff, uh, when I'm presenting these kind of templates for how to translate C code to assembly code, uh, we, we don't have to constantly think about, you know, does does a given register live in, uh, does a given local variable live in a register um, when we have to, you know, either read from it or write to it. Um, Later, I'll talk about how to deal with uh, when you have so much register pressure, you can't keep things in registers. Um, and mostly it will be by adding loads and stores around these blocks so that the, the, the code snippets themselves that reference those variables can just assume that they've been loaded uh, at that point. Um, so, but, but, but the working, the working assumption um, is that you know, when, when we reference a local variable, either re reading from one or writing to it, that it will be in a register. and um, I will typically just assume that whatever register it currently lives in is um, it correspond you know has a has a, a name that corresponds to uh, to its name in the C code. Um, um, so the, the 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 big thing you run into is you know uh, again this depends on the architecture but uh, you know typically all how should I formulate this. Uh, Initially, assume um, assume the register only has uh, word size registers, e.g., 32 bit. Uh, um, assume the target machine only has word size registers. Um, and so here we already run into. Um, into uh, this is why I wanted to, to mention uh, local variables before we get to this non-word sized data type stuff. Um, so, but, but uh, um, you know, easy. Um, let's see here. So, e easy to do uh, word size operations since they correspond uh, one to one to instructions. So, for example, um, if I have u and x and u and y, uh, these are 32 bits. I'm just gonna I'm gonna use this notation just to signify that they do have some initial value, but we don't know what it is. Um, if I do, you know, if I do this, it will just translate to uh, to to this. Um, And I mean, maybe I'll maybe we'll, we'll do it like this, just to make a three operand. Um, 
And so the first observation is that as long as you're doing kind of word size, working with word size quantities and doing word size operations, then things are usually very easy. You have to, you know, again, you have to worry about missing operations. Like if you're trying to do a greater than operation uh, or, um, I mean, actually an example is if you, on, on risk five, if you want to do something like this, um, there's actually no set, there, there's no set if equal uh, opcode or instruction. There's only like set if less than or something. So you have to synthesize certain cases, like I said, missing in operations or something you have to deal with. But generally speaking, when you're dealing with word size variables and word side operations, um, you're, you're kind of free and clear. There's, uh, there's not much of an issue. You, you have a fairly straightforward one-to-one -one translation. Um, st still have to, you know, um, synthesize um, uh, still have to uh, handle uh, missing operations. Um, This is a case where if we want to have a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, I mean, I guess let, let me be painfully explicit uh, initially with these stepwise transformations so I don't skip steps and people call me out on it. Um, because here we have an instance, uh, we have compound expressions. Um, and, and this is a case where rather than using a temp register, I might just be, uh, be lazy uh, and do something like this. Um, do it in place because often when you're synthesizing these missing operations you don't want to have to involve new registers it's nice if you can cannibalize the output register or something like that um, but you actually have to be a little bit careful about that um, sometimes but anyway um, let's do it like that and then we uh, Say like this, and then um, this corresponds to to this. And I should mention, um, I'll just be really explicit to show you what the pseudo instruction corresponds to uh, in the risk five. Um, Again, this will be a little bit slow, but I, I want to not hide anything for, for now. Um, so the way this works is um, if you are less than, I think that's how it goes. And, and this is just a pseudo instruction where basically being, uh, being equal to zero is the equivalent to being strictly less than one as a unsigned because there's only you know there's only one unsigned quantity less than one and that's zero um, but that's an example of, of that um, so let's see here let me just annotate these transformation steps um, Um, remove 
what did I call it up here? Um, all right. So this is um, this is an example. So where where did we start? Um, I'll just keep the stream going until we cover everything. Uh, and please ask questions along the way, by the way, because I haven't done a dry run of this with with people who are not like hardcore experts or whatever. So please uh, please ask questions if something is is you see mistakes or if something is unclear. And I'm happy. I would rather get those questions along the way. Um, so so we don't go down a rabbit hole and I, I've said something bogus and people are confused. But uh, but yeah. So uh, so where were we? Right. So so initially we were just saying you know hey uh, we'll assume all registers are in, uh, all variables are local variables are in registers. Global variables are a different story. Um, we assume that uh, the target machine only has uh, word size registers and in that case. Uh, um, All right, um, let's see. All right. Um, I think that's it for uh, for the word size stuff I wanted to say. So yeah, there's missing operations, um, and let's let's cover uh, smaller than word uh, variables and um, and operations. Um, And so, um, for example, um, if you have So um, let's get started with these simple cases here. Um, so suppose you have two U and eights, and um, this is what you want to synthesize. Um, Um, so, um, so, so, so let me say something about this. Um, for most operations, um, information flows from less significant bits to more significant bits. Or don't flow at all. If you bid with an operation like uh, and um, don't have any flow of information between bits, 
and addition and multiplication has has carries, but uh, uh, but information from lower bits to higher bits. Um, and so this means that um, you can often um, delay conversion that you can often do you know subword arithmetic uh, with word arithmetic and only worry about conversion um, at the end. Um, so what I mean by this is basically in a case like this, um, it really depends on what how C is used subsequently, whether you even need to treat this specially. Like for example, um, so uh, let's, let's do dumb conversion first or naive conversion. Uh, naive conversion is to do the following. And I'm not going to write these, by the way, I'm not going to write these explicit casts uh, because that's, in, that's sort of already implicit in C and I'm not going to make that explicit. I'm going to assume people know about that. Um, but it is useful to know um, actually. So may maybe I will do it. Um, any case, um, this uh, suggests that it's a good reason to avoid using anything but uh, word-sized arithmetic um, um, operations. Try to treat, um, you know, u and eight, u and sixteen, etc., uh, purely as storage types um, that are used for memory load stores. Uh, and do most things um, with, you know, ints, uints, etc., if possible. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I guess, I mean, I, I may even mentioned this in passing before. You should try, if possible, try to treat all of these smaller things like bytes and half words. Um, try to treat them as things that are, that live in memory. Um, because um, uh, you know, if if you want to store things compactly, or you're dealing with a certain existing binary format, you can't avoid it. If if a header says this field is a byte, you have to load it as a byte. Um, but once it's uh, once it's been loaded into a register, you don't have to treat it as a byte from that point on. Um, once you store it back out to memory, you can use a store byte instruction, for example, that will ignore the upper bits. And so in most cases, um, you sh if you can be explicit about that in your C code, the fact that you know, you're know you promoting it on load to a worse word size quantity, then things are just simpler in terms of the translation. You don't have to constantly worry about the semantics and whether they're different if it's one or the other. But, uh, but let, me, let, me, let me show you a very naive conversion though to show you how you would do it naively. Um, so basically, um, we assume that that the values of x and y already, like they're in a word size register, right? They have to be under our assumptions. So we assume they're already. We don't have to worry about you know the the implicit promotion that that this that this you know this int thing signifies. Uh, but I'll talk more about later about uh, cases where. Um, where you might actually want to do that, but um, so, so here's here's the naive translation. Um, let's see. Um, These examples, let me remove this repetitive stuff. This doesn't really 
carry any meaning. All right. Um, right, so the naive conversion is like this. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, to, to break this out. Maybe that's the sub expressions. Um, Direct conversion and um, and again, I'm going to pretend that we're using a temp register. We can actually use the same register, um, but because they have different like it, it, C wants to associate a type with a variable. This is one of the things you know. Assembly doesn't have a notion of a type. Everything's just like whatever the register is. Um, so I'm going to remove T1. I don't want to make you think that you should really be using that uh, separate register for that. But um, so basically what I will do is I will say uh, add C um, X, Y. And so this corresponds to this. And then this is the part that's kind of naive. So, so far we've really only done what we would do for the normal word add. Um, but now this is where things are potentially naive and, and slow. Um, um, you know, and, and the issue that I'm going to be addressing here is not going to be something that you can reason about locally what you should do. It really depends on the broader context of, of where you can uh, remove remove this inefficiency. But basically, um, we were talking before about sign extension. Here, it's we have to do uh, we have to do zero extension because the concern is if um, I mean actually let me sh let me show it to you. Um, Let's say W um, W is this or not W T one is this thing. Um, God, we're running out of, of alphabet. Um, maybe I'll call them A B C instead. <laughs> Sorry about that. So go back and read in the others. Um, so yeah, so let me show you uh, this case here. So we're really doing more than one thing, and I want to emphasize that we're going to basically be using this. We're going to be using this in a context where the fact that it's a byte is important. Because when we do this comparison here, uh, we assume that D, or we assume that C is some pre existing uh, byte size thing. And so if we do a direct comparison of these as word size registers, any carries from the addition that have flowed into the upper 24 bits, uh, and in this case, there can only be at most one carry bit, right? So it, it won't infect all of the higher bits. But uh, the point is, um, in a case like this, um, you. Um, you you can't just pretend you're doing word size arithmetic and then do the the comparison because the upper bits might differ, but the only bits that are meaningful are the, the lower eight bits. And so um, this 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 actually is important. Um, so let's see here, uh, T1 and this was A and B, and then D is from T1. Um, What was the next one? And then you have that comparison like this. Um, and so I guess the let's see, direct conversion to assembly. Um, first, we're not actually going to be using this T1. We're just going to get rid of it. So um, this is D. And um, this is where we do the conversion. So I wrote this kind of as a function call or, you know, an operator, uh, which I guess is more C++ actually than C. So I should, this is ion notation as well. So I'm just going to write this and assume that people know what I mean. Um, so, you know, if you think about what's going on, like I said, we do this addition as a word thing. There could be a carry into the ninth bit. Um, 
in this case, we could be clever and only clear the ninth bit or something, but let's do a zero extension. Um, um, and I'll, I, maybe I'll introduce a pseudo instruction just to, to, to have a one-to-one -one correspondence initially. Um, Um, you know, and then for, uh, and actually let me do this because I don't want to complete the issue with another pseudo instruction. Um, set if less than E, C, D. So this is E, int E equals C less than D. Um, uh, expand cx8 pseudo instruction um, and i already mentioned before that what you do is you left shift by 24 and then you right shift again by 24 and uh, that might seem like a no op but because uh, well, in this case, I guess you could probably do it differently for first. Uh, I guess in this case, we can actually do it better. Um, okay. I think that's right. Um, let me just see here. All right, that looks reasonable. That looks reasonable. Um, and again, the reason we don't have to use a T1 as a separate register is that um, we're assuming we're just going to be clobbering D afterwards anyway when we do this AND. So uh, we can just do that in there. All right. Um, and, and like I said, this kind of thing is sort of pessimistic. Um, this is the kind of conversion that um, if you know more about what operations have been involved uh, in producing the operands, um, maybe you can remove some or all of these kinds of zero extensions. Um, maybe you can, rather than zero extending the operands, maybe you can use a special operation for a comparison or whatever else you're doing with them. Um, but uh, I, I do want to give you sort of the foolproof recipe, which is like any time there is a conversion, you do the conversion naively. Um, and if this was, like I said, if this was uh, not a u and 8, but an int 8, you would have, uh, rather than this uh, uh, zero extension, you would do a sign extension. And the way you do a sign extension, um, uh, if we were using int 8 rather than uh, u and 8, it would be SX8 instead of um, CX8. And uh, and the uh, and the uh, sign extension age extension would expand to um, would expand to uh, what was I saying? Uh, shift left by 24, and then shift right arithmetically by uh, a 24, which smears the sign bit over the upper 24 bits. All right. Um, let me just put this in so I don't forget to save it. Um, Alrighty.
have we already been going over an hour? Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay. Maybe that's it. Um, keep in mind that um, Risk Five and other architectures, while they um, may not have support arithmetic operations, they almost always have subword byte and half word uh, store to memory operations. Um, so let me show an example of this, you know, no, actually, I guess that's not really, yeah, let, let's do it like this. Let me take this example. Let me write this. Um, okay. Um, so what, what what we're going to do here is um, you're going to well the final code is going to be a plus b and then um, Um, you know, I'm just going to do it like that. Um, um, yeah. Uh, and I should mention here um,
All right. Um, so yeah, this, this was just kind of a note I wanted to make is that um, in a case like this, where you're, for example, storing to a, a global, or uh, or you're or you're doing, um, you know, the equivalent of this uh, with a pointer store. So if you're storing through a pointer, um, you can you can exploit the fact that it, it will let you, you know, it, it only reads the relevant bits basically. So you don't have to worry about cleaning up the higher bits because the store instruction, uh, if you do a store by, it ignores it. So that's really all I wanted to say here. Um, all right. Um, all right, all right, all right. I'm just going to continue going. Um, please interrupt with questions. Someone was asking, do I like assembly? Uh, sort of. I mean, I I, uh, I don't mind it, but I mean, I, I don't go out of my way to write it. Um, but we were mostly doing this as a tutorial. But if people have uh, sort of pertinent questions about the, the material, uh, pl please butt in and uh, let me know if anything's unclear or uh, or we have any yeah other other things you want to ask about. So um, uh, let's cover um, let's cover other other types of data. So I covered sort of subword like u and 8 u and 16 that sort of thing uh, we only covered u and 8 and int 8 but it would be the same with 16 bit stuff you just have to shift by 16 rather than 24 when you're doing the zero assign extension um okay um um Size off -rans. Um This is the conventional way to do it. If you're on a 32-bit platform like uh, RV32i, which is you know the 32-bit variant of Rescribe that we're uh, currently working with uh, on, on Bitwise. If you want to do um, UN64 arithmetic, um, and there, you know, there's no special instructions for it, um, you usually store. Um, you, you you can you can store uh, each local variable in two registers, and synthesize um, double width uh, operations from uh, from you know, from single width operations. Um, so, okay, here's a good question. Uh, how does this extend for 64-bit or 128-bit RISC-V variants? I assume you have to treat 32-bit uh, memory operations at sub a subword and all and potentially even 64-bit operations. Trying to think that through. The instruction formats are the same. Is it possible to write um, CPU 32-64 128-bit portable RISC-V uh, ASM? I don't think it's possible given how RISC-V is. Um, so let me bring up the instruction manual. Uh, I, I won't deep dive too much, but uh, I do want to point you uh, in the right direction. Um, if you do a, if you do an add on RV32 RV64, it will mean an add of the 64-bit registers because the same registers like X1 and so on are now double width, right? They're 64-bit, and when you do a plain add, um, those are adds on the full 64 bits of the register. However, um, they do have um, 32-bit variants of the operations in the 64-bit instruction set. So that's an important thing to note. Um, and they're ex they have a W at the end. Um, so if you do an add W, it's go going to basically act, not quite, because you have to worry about what happens to the upper bits, but it, it will basically do a sign extension. Uh, it will do the lower... It, it will do the equivalent of the you know the 32-bit edition. Then it will do the sign extension for you as a as an after effect. Um, 
And so I guess you have to worry about now unsigned versus signed extension. But I guess the logic is that zero extension is cheaper if you have to do it manually. And anyway, but, but the point is uh, on the 64-bit variant, they do in fact offer explicit instructions for doing 32-bit arithmetic, even though the default, the thing that would be an add instruction on RV32 is now a 64-bit instruction, but now they have this new set of things uh, that you can use and target. Um, and because it does sign extension always, uh, I assume you have to do some extra work in order to, to handle uh, things correctly, but um, so the answer is no, you can't do portable code. I'm sure there's some code that could be written that is portable if you're very careful, um, but by default, like it, it wouldn't just automatically work, um, unless I'm totally missing something. But that, that's a good question. I don't know about RV. Maybe they have. Yeah, I don't think I don't know how much of this is specified. Um, not much here. Do they have 64-bit add variants that do sign extension and the 64-bit stuff? Oh yeah, so they have the D instructions that do this double width stuff. Yeah, so they kind of expand on RV64 in the same kind of way, where now add, add the, the default add operates on all 128 bits. You still have the add W for the 32-bit that sign extends, and now that would sign extend into the full 128-bit register, so that would be like you know, 128 minus 32 bits of sign extension, which is pretty massive. Um, and then there's the add D, which is a 64-bit, explicit 64-bit add with 64-bit sign extension into the full 128 bits. So they have the provisions for, for doing the math, but the, the instructions change their existing behavior. Those default arithmetic ops that change their behavior, but that's a very good question. All right. Um, okay. Um, the 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 details vary uh, vary with the architecture. Um, E.g., um, it's easier to generate double width ads. Um, it's easier, faster to generate double width ads if the arc arch uh, has a uh, carry flag uh, for example on x86 you could do um, Okay, so yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details because we're it's, it's taking a lot longer to cover and we haven't gotten very far yet. Um, maybe I will. Um, do, yeah, this probably needs to be multiple streams, so maybe I'll go another 20 minutes uh, and see where we end up, and then I'll return in subsequent streams. Um, and that way, I can also get feedback between the streams. So we're starting with stuff that's pretty meat and potatoes. I thought we'd be able to cover everything today, but that looks uh, pretty hopeless. But um, but but just to round this off. Um, since this is one case where kind of missing instructions, in a sense, come into play, um, almost all the older architectures, and this goes back to like 8-bit micros, had this add with carry instruction. And it was really important because if you only have, for example, 8-bit uh, arithmetic ops, 
you, I mean, there's almost nothing you can do that only needs eight bits of addition. You almost always, even on those eight bit machines, you often ended up having to do 16 bit arithmetic. And the way you would do that is you would just have two instructions in the style. Um, of course, you know, so I mean, it depends, but like on, on 6502, um, uh, I guess one of the operands would always be the A accumulator register. And so, um, you might do something like this. Um, let's see. I mean, this is really, <laughs> I don't know why I'm digressing with this, but let's say we do this. Load A, add Y, uh, store A to Z, uh, load X plus one. So these are like zero page operands of fixed locations. Um, Okay, I don't. This is a side trick. Let me just finish it. I don't know why I'm doing that. Uh, add y plus. So then we have to do the add c because we want to get the carry we from from this one here. Um, So yeah, um, if you guys have been paying attention, I don't think anyone asked it when we did the, the original architecture over you way back, but one thing that RISC-V chose to leave out is it doesn't have any internal flags related to, uh, you know, carries or parity or uh, overflow or any of these traditional um, status flag bits that um, in, in, in older architectures that, um, had separate compare and branch instructions. Typically, the way the compare instruction would uh, would communicate to the branch instruction, I mean, the way they would they would uh, have data flow between them, is through the flag bits. Um, and uh, that's then once you have that, it's very easy to do something like add add with carry because you already have the flag bits and you just have to add that as an implicit input uh, carry to that addition. But um, Risk Five got rid of all that, and so it actually doesn't have a, a a way to do that that is as compact. Um, um, which is a little bit unfortunate, I think. Um, um, let's see if I remember how to do it. I mean, Actually, let, let me let me just do it. Let, let me think about the best way to do it. I actually haven't thought about it, which I should have. Um, but, but let me think about how to synthesize it. And the it, multiplies actually. Um, 
Okay, let me think. Um. I mean, the thing you can always do, even for the multiplication case, so. Okay, someone's mentioning 2.4. Uh, oh, here we go. I gotcha. So they use set if less than. Okay, that's pretty clever. Um, well, this is for overflow checks, yeah. So I guess that's one thing you can do. But anyway, yeah, l l let's not get sidetracked to that because I hadn't. I haven't thought through that. I mean, I, I can see a stupid way of doing it, but I almost don't want to write it out. But anyway, um, if you look at the multiply instructions, they have this thing where uh, it, it, on, on, on x86, um, on x86, even on the 32-bit, you know, on legacy 32-bit, um, if you multiply two 32-bit operands, you get a 64-bit result in the EAX and EDX um registers. So this is like a double width result split across two registers. So that's one instruction producing two, you know, two word sized outputs that together constitute a single double width result. Um, risk five doesn't have that because it doesn't, it never writes more than one register per cycle, right? Uh, you know, it, it has like a single write port basically. So if you want, uh, or it only requires a single write port. So if you want to, um, to get the uh, the upper half of the result, which admittedly you don't like most of the time when you do, you know, if I'm if I'm doing, you know, I have my C code and I'm doing I'm multiplying two uh, two int thirty twos, I only care about the lower bits because that's what I'm going to assign to another int thirty two or whatever. Um, but you can get the upper bits by using mul h or mul h u, depending on whether it's a signed or an unsigned uh, multiplication. Um, so you can get the the two halves of the result in two separate instructions and uh, fancy processors can even detect the pattern of a mul followed by a mul h and internally synthesize it, They'd like do what's called macro op fusion, where it flows through the pipeline as a single operation. Uh, so that so there's provisions for that, but um, the instruction set doesn't specify, uh, it specifies those two things as two separate instructions. But anyway, um, so not going to go into this, but this is a, like, again, this is just a, I guess, a fancier example of missing operations where you have to work it out. Uh, division, I think actually there's basically no no help with doing divisions here. Uh, like there's nothing like the mul h uh, for uh, division. So let me let me just verify that. Um, right. So you can see there's mul and mul h, um, but for doing the division. If you're trying to divide two 64-bit quantities, I mean, it's a little bit of extra work. But anyway, that's typically a runtime library would actually have a function you can call uh, that does that for you, I think. But uh, so, so it's maybe a, it's probably a little bit more intricate. Um, so anyway, yeah, let's not get sidetracked. Uh, you should probably stop the stream soon. But but anyway, um, we'll cover how to do this later when we write the compiler because we have to handle it. But uh, I, I'm not really prepared to bust out an optimized instruction sequence for these uh, for these missing operations here. So I'll have to to, to look at that. Um, all right. Um, 
So where does that put us? So we talked about locals, we're assuming they're registers. We talked about non-word size data types, both things that are smaller and bigger. We haven't covered arrays. That stuff is pretty easy. That's just really pointer arithmetic. So that's sort of subsumed by pointer arithmetic, which we'll cover here. Um, structs and unions. Okay, I guess that's stuff for today. So we covered a bunch of these missing operations. We covered local variables. We covered subword and superword, uh, integers. I guess we implicitly covered a little bit about nested expressions, but I'll, I want to talk about that in a more general context. And we didn't talk about any control flow or functions and how to handle stack frames and calls and stuff like that. So maybe that's okay for today. Um, maybe that's okay for today. Um, any questions? Um, someone's asking, kind of unfortunate to not be able to do a double width arithmetic without a branch though. You don't have to do a branch. You can do a conditional set, uh, I think. You can do a conditional set. Uh, they were using branches because they were trying to demonstrate how to do overflow detection, where you actually want to go into a trap handler if there's overflow. You know, like for example, uh, Rust specifies by default that all arithmetic operations have to trap if they overflow, like signed arithmetic ops, I mean. Um, and so I think you, you know, you don't have to do this part. You can just, um, use this as a flag, basically. That's an implicit zero or one operand for a subsequent addition. So you don't have to do this branch check. You just, I guess you just need these two. Um, all right. Um, yeah, any questions? Otherwise, I think that's what I want to cover today. That was already, it didn't feel like a lot, but when I just look at what we, we went through, I guess uh, it's a good place to stop. It's enough to get us started. Uh, someone's asking, since we're building our own, and I assume you mean our own CPU, do you get tempted to add non-standard missing operations? Um, I guess yes and no. I kind of want, I think where we're going to add missing operations, not really missing operations, I think once we get further, I want to do sort of shader type stuff. Um, so maybe we will do our own SIMD extension, and maybe we'll do some, I mean, there's a bunch of optional extensions already for things like bitcasts that are in progress. Which could be, I mean, so the, so we may add some things like that, but for the basic stuff here, I kind of don't want to get too mired into adding them because, I mean, in the case of stuff like the flag bits, it's kind of not in the spirit of the instruction set, and for other things, um, it means that now we're creating gratuitous incompatibility, and it's kind of nice for the basic instruction set kind of things that we have compatibility so that. Um, you know, our all our whole tool tool chain is just going to work fine without any issues with uh, with existing CPUs and existing emulators and existing everything everything being like that. So uh, I think if we add missing instructions, it will more be for sort of acceleration of higher end shader type things maybe or uh, whatnot. But yeah, uh, yeah. So someone's asking if assembly is lower level language. Yes, it's. Uh, Assembly is a thin layer over the actual machine language that the CPU directly executes. Okay. All righty. Maybe that's it for today. Uh, I'll, I'll be around on the chat for a few more minutes if there's any questions uh, people have left over. Otherwise, uh, I, I think we'll probably uh, cover this kind of stuff for the next couple of sessions, at least one more session. Maybe but I think at this rate, it'll probably be three total, so two more. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in feedback, so uh, feel free to reach out on the Discord or on the forums or on Twitter if you have uh, stuff you want me to cover or stuff that's unclear or you just have comments or whatever. So uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, we will continue with this next time, which is Friday today, right? Oh, it's Wednesday. Okay, so uh, two more days. We'll do one on Friday to continue this walkthrough. So that's it for today.